Good morning. Welcome back to another episode of the Red Chip Poker Podcast. I'm your host, James Splitsuit Sweeney. But today I'm going to be taking a step back and actually letting Coach Weasel host this episode and probably the next few. Coach Weasel, if you are already on the Discord, you should be well aware of him. He is extremely active over there. Also has a bunch of videos in the pro membership and has done a bunch of entries in core as well. Weasel is excellent and today is going to talk to you about some GTO preflop trends that I think you are going to find extremely interesting and more importantly, very, very helpful. Helpful. And just as a heads up, if you're listening to this in an audio only format, there is a full visualization available on the YouTube channel. So if you're not already subscribed, definitely make sure to subscribe to the Red Chip Poker YouTube channel and check it out as well as the next upcoming episodes as well. As always, if you need anything, don't hesitate to let me know. Discord is always the place, redshippoker.com slash discord to join for free. Without further ado, here's Weasel. <laughs> What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Red Chip Poker Podcast. Today, I'll be your host. This is Coach Weasel, and we're going to be talking about GTO preflop trends. We'll think about three ways that the player pool is GTOifying their preflop strategies. So the first trend that we're going to think about is larger opens later. If we just recap on the history of preflop open raise sizings. This is a very common question. How large should we open raise from each position at the table? If we think about the traditional advice, it's to open raise larger in earlier position and open raise smaller in later position. So in the context of an online game, that might be something like a three big blind open raise from under the gun, but a min raise from the button maybe even a min raise from the small blind. In a live context, you can multiply all of those sizings by two, potentially. So it could be five or six big blind open from UTG, or it could be a three big blind open from the button. Either way, we still see this pattern where it's a large open in early and a small open in later position. Now, the obvious question is, why did players decide that that was the correct way to play? And it turns out that the justification for that approach is fairly weak. It's usually something along the lines of, we should open raise larger in early position because our range is stronger. Or we should open raise small in late position because our range is weaker. Now it's true that we have a weaker range in late position, but why is that a reason to open raise smaller? The reasoning is not necessarily valid. When we think about post-flop play, for example, with a polarized range, the more air hands we have as part of our betting range, the larger the bet sizing we'd ideally use because it allows us to fire more of our air combos. We can have a much higher bluff to value ratio when we use a large sizing. Now, although this is a pre-flop situation and we can't always apply post-flop concepts directly, we can see that it's not always the case that just because a range is stronger, it should bet larger. Now, the problem we had in the earlier days of poker is that it's very hard to verify that something could sound logical, such as open raise larger because our range is stronger, but we didn't really have any decent way of verifying that. Well, the good news is we have access to GTO solvers. We can verify a lot of the assumptions that we made in the earlier days of poker. So what have GTO preflop solves taught us about open raise sizing? And we actually find that this solution is the opposite to what players originally thought. By running GTO solves where we give the solver different open raise sizings, we find out that the solver does better with larger raises in late position and smaller raises in early position. So an example of a reasonable strategy in an online context might be min raising, from under the gun and hijack, perhaps 2.2x from the cutoff, 2.5x from the button, and three big blinds from the small blind. In the live context, you can multiply those sizings by two. It does depend on the limits you're playing. It seems some live games, the preflop sizing does correlate a lot more closely with online play, but some of the lower stakes live games, it could easily be 2x or more in terms of open raise sizings. But the important thing here is not the precise sizing that's being used, but the pattern where we open raise smaller in early, but larger sizings in later position. We can now verify using solvers that this type of approach maximizes the EV, at least in a GTO sense. 
Of course, that doesn't mean that it's always going to be the best approach. One of the limitations of the way that players use GTO solvers is it will usually only give the solver one specific preflop sizing that it can use. So the way this type of analysis might work is we run a solver model, for example, with a button min raise sizing. Then we run a new solve with a button 2.5x and compare the EVs. We find out that the EV of the button 2.5x open is performing better than the EV of the button min raise. But what we don't typically do is run a tree with both sizings and say the button can open to two big blinds or can open to 2.5 big blinds and then ascertain whether the solver is mixing across those two different sizings. The reason for this is fairly straightforward. Building preflop solves is very RAM or memory intensive. So we usually only give the solver one option in terms of bet sizing in each preflop scenario. What this might mean is that it could easily be GTO correct to mix our range across different open sizings. In fact, in scenarios where we do give the solver more than one preflop sizing, the solver usually mixes its range between those two sizings. So although it makes sense overall to have a larger raising range in late position, there could still be some holdings which perform better as part of a smaller open raising range. So using one sizing from each position is completely fine, but it's probably a simplification of how we should actually be playing. We should potentially be using more than one open raise sizing from each position at the table. Exploitative considerations are important as well. So as a simple example, imagine that we dealt pocket aces UTG and in our head we have this preflop trend. We should usually be using a small open raise sizing because we're in early. But we look behind us on the table, we see there are some very weak players who are happy to call large preflop opens. Does it make sense to use a min raise when we have those types of opponents at the table? Probably not. We could likely get away with a five or even six big blind open, even in an online context. And we should likely be doing that as an exploit. So keep in mind as a general theme here, we should be looking to open raise larger in later positions and smaller in early but there could still be some mixing involved, especially if we have exploitative considerations that are important in a certain game. The other thing to consider here is that as this trend becomes more popular, as the defender, we're going to be facing a large proportion of min raises from UTG and MP. So when you think, for example, about something like big blind defense, we typically don't have to play that many hands against a UTG 3x open, but against a UTG min raise, and this is just one example, according to the solver, we're supposed to have a cold calling range of around 30% from the big blind against the UTG min raise. So this GTO trend is also going to affect us as the defender. We're going to be having to defend more frequently from the big blind against UTG and MP opens as the average size of these opens tends towards that min raise sizing. So if we just carry on using our standard defending ranges in this spot, which are maybe designed to face a three big blind open, we're going to be under defending the big blind as the population min raises more and more from these early positions. Moving on to trend number two, larger out of position three bet size. So if we think of a very typical scenario, we're in the big blind and we're facing a 2.5x open from the button. And just take a moment to think about your standard three bet sizing in that spot. Now I can imagine answers ranging anywhere from about seven big blinds at the low end to about 11 big blinds at the high end. And normally when button makes a 2.5 big blind open and the big blind three bets to 10 or 11 big blinds, that's typically considered a large three bet sizing. After all, it's over four X the size of the button open raise. So the obvious question is which sizing is better? Are the players electing for the small three bet sizing getting the best of it? Or are the players who are using the large three bet sizing generating the highest EV? Well, initially in the early days of poker, it's just a battle of opinions or a battle of preference. Some players prefer the smaller sizing 
others prefer the larger sizing. But once again, we now have the ability to verify that since we have access to preflop solves. Once again, this is not a preflop solve where we typically give the solver five different preflop sizings to choose from. The tree would just end up being too large. It's not practical. This is more a case of run a solver model where the big blind three bets to seven big blinds. Have a look at the EV. Run a new tree where the big blind three bets to eight big blinds. Have a look at the EV of that three betting range or the EV of the overall big blind strategy, including cold calling. We get some surprising results here. What we find is that the EV appears to max out at around 13 big blinds in this situation. So very large three bet sizing. And even the players who were three betting kind of large in a big blind versus button scenario were possibly not three betting as large as 13 big blinds. And we're seeing this type of thing trending more and more. In fact, this is almost a tell at this stage where if you're playing in an online environment, imagine we open the button to 2.5 big blinds and the big blind three bets to 13 big blinds. Now it's such a large sizing, it feels so out of context of the typical flow of action that it draws our attention immediately to the question, why is the sizing so large? Well, it's probably because this player has access to this type of GTO information. So we can straight away, when we see this sizing, infer that our opponent is some type of reg who is interested in basing his strategy around GTO principles. And this type of sizing recommendation from the solver is not just big blind versus button, but also applies to small blind versus button scenarios as well. So the next obvious question is, why is the solver playing this way? Why are very large three bet sizings incentivized while we're OOP? Here are a couple of possible answers to this question. So the first one is we have this disinclination to encourage preflop calls from our opponent when we're OOP. So just going back to the first trend, we saw that small blind race first in sizings are recommended to be quite large, perhaps three big blinds in an online context. And part of the problem here, if we min raise the small blind is that big blind just gets such an amazing price to call preflop and gets to play post flop against us in position. That's usually a fairly profitable scenario for the big blind. And ultimately, we don't want to make it that cheap for him to be able to see that profitable situation at a high frequency. So it's a similar type of idea here. If let's say the button open raises to 2.5 and we three bet to seven big blinds from the small blind, it's just too easy and too cheap for our opponent to call with a very wide range and have the advantage of position post flop. The way we can neutralize to some extent that positional advantage is making sure at the very least that there is a high cost of entry. It's much more expensive now for our opponent to call and play in position against us post flop. We'll also find that we simply just pick up the pot a lot more often pre flop so we're going to be playing less frequently in 3-bet pots OOP and the same applies to the RFI strategy from the small blind. If we min raise from the small blind, we'll be playing a large amount of pots OOP. Whereas if we 3x, we're still going to be playing a fair share of pots OOP, but we are going to generate an increased amount of fold equity preflop, which overall, when we're OOP, is going to maximize the EV of our entire range. And that's what we're looking to do here. There's another interesting aspect of the larger sizing at work here. If we run different solver models where we first of all have a small three bet sizing and then compare the range of hands that's three bet at that small raise sizing range to the range of hands that's three bet at the larger raise sizing range. We see something interesting in terms of the range composition. Smaller three bet ranges are significantly more depolarized. They don't have a large amount of semi bluffs slash speculative hands perhaps holdings like 7-8 suited or 7-5 suited, depending on the scenario. When we look at the range distribution at the larger three bet sizing, when the solver's given that option, we see much heavier mixing. 
So although the overall effect of the three bet range is still one of depolarization, we see lots of the weak holdings mixed into the three bet range as well. There's a whole bunch of stuff like King X suited, suited gappers, suited connectors being three bet at some frequency while also being flat called. And we are talking specifically about the big blind here because small blind, one of the other GTO trends we're not going to talk about in this podcast is the fact that players often play three, but only from the small blind. They don't have a flatting range. I have a solved range in front of me now and just looking at some of the hands that are mixed into the recommended three bet range, big blind versus button. We have most of the suited kings mixed in with some frequency, a decent amount of suited queens, suited jacks, things like 10, seven, 10, six suited, six, seven, seven, eight, eight, nine, even some offsuit aces mixed in with a fairly high frequency. Now, why might having the presence of these weaker holdings actually be a reason to use a larger three bet sizing? To think about the ultimate goal in terms of maximizing our EV, it's to try and reach the river with a polarized range. Polarized ranges by the river are simply the most profitable type of range that we can have. And basically, the more of our speculative or air hands that we can discharge as part of a bluff, the more profitable our overall strategy is going to be. And the wider three bet range, including more speculative hands at the larger three bet sizing, allows us to set up this type of river scenario for ourselves more consistently. Whereas if we're using a very small three bet sizing, forcing ourselves to have this very depolarized type range when we three bet preflop, we're just gonna end up having showdown value a lot by the time we reach the river. It's going to be very hard to construct these very profitable polarized ranges by the river. So to recap on our two reasons why the large three bet sizing makes sense, we disincline our opponent to defend very often when they have the advantage of position. And the larger three bet sizing also allows us to three bet more speculative holdings, which then allows us to more consistently set up these very profitable polarized ranges on the river. Let's think about GTO trend number three, and this is small blind completes. Now, if we go back 10 years or so before we had the advantage of being able to consult solved preflop ranges, Completing in the small blind was something that no good player really ever did. And that's simply because small blind completing in an unopened scenario was considered the same as open limping. It's not actually the same as open limping. Small blind completing is different because we already have that 0.5 of a big blind invested. But in the minds of players back then, it was exactly the same as open limping. And obviously open limping preflop is terrible. So no one did it. Now we have the advantage of seeing solved output for various preflop scenarios. And although we find that open limping in general is not the best option, we should generally either be open raising or folding when we're first to act preflop, the small blind is a huge exception. In fact, it's impossible to play correctly without small blind completing with some frequency. And the reason for that is fairly straightforward. Let's just think about a typical RFI range from the small blind. It's probably going to look something like 38% if you consult a GTO solved preflop range. We can't really get away with raising wider than that, assuming we have a very good opponent in the big blind. It's just going to become exploitable. However, that doesn't mean we should only have a 38% VPIP in that situation. We can profitably play more than 38% of hands in a small blind unopened scenario, provided we're willing to utilize the small blind complete option. In other words, the only way to maximize the number of hands we can play in a small blind unopened scenario is to utilize the small blind complete option. So it's a mandatory part of small blind play. In terms of frequencies, GTO recommends that 38% or so RFI, depends on the solve, could be closer to 36, could be close to 40% RFI, let's say 38% RFI, and then around 12% complete at the tighter side. Sometimes you see solvers recommending closer to 15 or even 20% complete, but it does seem as a rough guide 
GTO wise, we should have round about 50% VPIP in a small blind unopened scenario. So roughly 38% RFI and 12% complete. Now that's the GTO value. So just keep in mind that I routinely recommend to players that they actually play close to 70% VPIP on average in the small blind. In fact, when the idea of being able to small blind complete first disseminated from the high stakes circles, the belief was that it was GTO correct to have around 70% VPIP from the small blind. So about 40% RFI and 30% complete. Now solvers have disproved that. We know now that it's actually close to 50% VPIP in the small blind, maybe 55% at the higher end. But it turns out that exploitatively, we can still routinely get away with playing closer to 70% VPIP in the small blind. If our opponent in the big blind is a very weak player, we may even be able to play 100% VPIP. So it could be something like 40% RFI and 60% complete. So be aware of the GTO recommended values here, 38% RFI and 12% complete, but understand that in the vast majority of games, we can get away with completing much wider in this scenario. Now the reason why we can get away with playing more hands in this situation. Let's think about what big blind is supposed to do according to a GTO solver when facing a small blind complete. Big blind is supposed to ISO. Now we'll use the term ISO just so we're clear on what we're talking about, but I guess technically the action is already ISO'd heads up. But big blind is supposed to ISO around 40% of the time against a small blind complete. When we have a look at population data, we see that many player pools are ISO raising about 28% of the time against a small blind complete. So raising significantly less often than they're supposed to in this spot, according to GTO solvers. What this means is when we complete in the small blind, we're getting to see the flop way more often than we're supposed to in the majority of player pools. So we're supposed to get to see a cheap flop when big blind checks back around 60% of the time, but in many player pools, we're seeing the flop 72% of the time. So even if we were to complete a very weak and wide range in the small blind and almost always fold against an ice raise from the big blind, we'd still be exploiting our opponent because he's allowing us to see the flop way too wide with our small blind completing range. And that's why, although GTO says complete around 12% of the time, we can get away with completing around 30% of the time with predominantly weak holdings and then continuing with our standard 40% RFI range. That 40% RFI range is going to include all of the stronger hands we typically raise first in with. Now, of course, that's not GTO correct. In terms of GTO play, we now have to protect our completing range with some stronger holdings like aces, kings, queens with some frequency. And we have the intention of going for a complete raise in that scenario when we get ISO'd by the big blind. But unless our opponent in the big blind is actually ISOing at somewhere close to that 40% recommended GTO frequency, we do not need to worry about protecting our completing range with premiums. Okay, let's summarize on our three GTO trends. I'm gonna put them into easy, actionable, recommended bullet points here. So firstly, think about using larger open raise sizing from later position and smaller open raise sizings from early position. Trend number two, think about increasing your three bet sizing when OOP. So if button makes it 2.5x, you definitely want to be three betting above 10 big blind sizing from the big blind, perhaps even 13 big blinds as we saw recommended by the solver. Trend number three, if you don't currently complete in the small blind in unopened situations, think about incorporating that into your game. It allows us to play with the maximum possible amount of pre-flop holdings in that situation, which in turn maximizes our win rate. Thanks for listening, guys. This was Coach Weasel, and this was the Red Chip Open.
And that is going to wrap it up for this episode of the Red Ship Poker Podcast. I really hope you enjoyed. As always, if you have any comments or questions, please don't hesitate to let us know on the Discord. You can always at Weasel or at Splitsuit on there if you want to talk to either of us specifically. But again, the URL for that is redshippoker.com slash Discord to get over there. Join for free. And it's a really, really wonderful community if you're not already a part of it. So thank you, as always, for sticking around, tuning in. And again, if you need anything, don't hesitate to let us know. Otherwise, we'll see you back shortly with a brand new episode. Episode. In the meantime, good luck out there and happy grinding.